everyone. This is Daryl Falk on Coming to Peace with Science, and this is part two of the series on chromosome two. In the previous video, we talked about the origin of human chromosome two and discussed three remarkable features. First, sitting near the middle of the chromosome are two sets of telomeres in opposite orientation to one another. Those two codes normally serve to block enzymes from chewing away at the ends of the chromosome, making it shorter and shorter thereby destroying genes in the process. But this chromosome, chromosome two, has two extra telomeres, and they are internal and they're somewhat degraded. Second, chromosome two also has an extra centromere, the structure that is important to evenly distribute the chromosome duplicates from when one cell divides to become two cells. The extra centromere, like the extra telomeres, is somewhat degraded, but it's there, and chromosome two has a second centromere near the middle. Third, the gene order and banding pattern of human chromosome 2 match up almost exactly with that which we find in two smaller chromosomes in the great apes. This is consistent with the notion that our chromosome 2 is the product of a fusion between these two smaller chromosomes in one of our ancestors. However, that's not the strongest reason for this conclusion. The two degraded internal telomeres are at exactly the same place, bounded by exactly the same genes as the position that the real telomeres occupy in great apes. Furthermore, the genes on either side of the centromere relic are almost exactly the same genes as those found on either side of the real centromere on one of the two short great ape chromosomes. If indeed chromosome 2 is the fused product of two ancestral chromosomes, that would mean that there must have been a single individual in which this highly specific event with a single resulting junction point occurred. What can we say about that individual? Uh, when did he or she live? And would an individual with a fused chromosome be healthy? Well, since all the genes would have been present in two copies, there would be no genetic deficiency. However, this chromosome would have had two centromeres in the single fused chromosome. Wouldn't that be a problem to have a chromosome with two real centromeres? Remember what centromeres do. They separate duplicated chromosomes to ensure even distribution when one cell becomes two. Early work from studying chromosomes in corn and fruit flies and other organisms showed that when a chromosome has two centromeres, the strings or spindle fibers from one end of a dividing cell can attach to one centromere and strings or spindle fibers from the other end can attach to the other centromere. As the strings pull on their respective centromeres, the single chromosome is stretched by being pulled in two different directions and it will break in two with one broken end going to one cell and the other broken end going to the other cell. Cell. So doesn't this mean that this ancient individual with his or her fused double centromere chromosome would die as a young embryo due to ongoing chromosome damage? No, and here's why. Humans are different than corn plants and fruit flies and many other organisms in this regard. Extensive work shows that in humans, when chromosomes fuse, usually only one of the two centromeres is used from then on. One centromere usually dominates over the other and becomes the one sole place for string or spindle fiber attachment. Interestingly, we know some things about the characteristics of the centromere which does not get used. The suppressed centromere is often associated with the absence of a particular bit of code known as the satellite. Three, here is the most interesting part. In chimpanzees, the chromosome 2p centromere has the satellite, whereas the centromere of the other chromosome, chromosome 2q, does not have the satellite. That 2q centromere functions fine as long as there is no other centromere present. It is no coincidence then that after the fusion, it is the 2q centromere, the one without the satellite that is silenced and that centromere becomes residual. This is exactly what happens still today when chromosomes fuse. The one with the satellite is used, the other one is not. The fusion of two chromosomes is not, by the way, a particularly rare event in humans. For example, the fusion of chromosome 13 and chromosome 14 occur at a frequency of about 1.5 out of every 10,000 conceptions, roughly 500 per year in the United States alone, and about 10,000 per year worldwide. Individuals with one normal chromosome and one fused chromosome are known as heterozygotes. What about the children of these heterozygotes? We know from work with people with fused chromosomes today that heterozygous individuals are less fertile. 
We also know the reason. If a person is heterozygous for a fused chromosome, there can be an unequal distribution of the chromosomes in the production of gametes, that is, sperm or egg. So, many of the gametes, frequently more than half, are defective. Thus, individuals heterozygous, that is, with one copy of a fused chromosome, will produce fewer offspring. We now know that. Given this clear disadvantage, how could it be that a fused chromosome could come to predominate and eventually take over the population? All humans now carry a fused chromosome too. The ancestral condition with its two smaller chromosomes has been completely displaced. How could this be if the heterozygotes would have been less fertile? There are two ways in which a fused chromosome could come to predominate despite the reduced fertility of the early hybrids. First, there is extensive data to show that the genes adjacent to a telomere out there on the tip mutate at a higher frequency. This is partly because there is duplicated code out near a chromosome tip. But there are other reasons as well. What this means then is that sometimes there could be a significant advantage to moving genes away from the tip of a chromosome. A chromosome fusion does that. It internalizes some genes in a manner that shelters them from the high mutation rate out of the tip. Here's the second reason. In small populations, we know that certain genetic changes increase in frequency not because they are advantageous, but just by chance. If you flip a coin five times and only five times, there is a reasonable chance, one out of every 32 actually, that all five flips could be heads with no tails at all in those five flips. Indeed, with only five flips, they could by chance all turn up heads even if the coin is slightly loaded to increase the probability of tails. There's still, by chance, a probability of getting all heads. However, if you flip a coin 500 times, then there is virtually no chance of getting 500 flips all showing heads and none coming up tails. Chance events become important in small populations, and our ancestors likely existed in small hunter-gatherer groups subject to chance fluctuations that can happen when the numbers are small. When gene or chromosome frequency changes because of chance events at low population size, it is called genetic drift. If indeed there were small localized populations in our ancient history, it is conceivable that this could have contributed to the increase in the fusion chromosome despite the reduced fertility of hybrids. Most likely, however, it was not a single protected gene or genetic drift alone that contributed to the spread of the fusion. It was probably some combination of a number of protected genes together with some genetic drift which brought about the spread of this chromosome. So the bottom line is that the finding of a chromosome fusion is fully consistent with our knowledge from genetics. A residual telomere exists at exactly the same point as real telomeres in our great ape cousins. And a rudimentary centromere exists at exactly the same spot in the human chromosome as we find a real centromere in the great apes. Objections that non-geneticists might raise, like the viability of a chromosome with two centromeres, or reduced fertility of hybrids, simply don't hold up. When taken together with the enormous amount of other data suggesting common ancestry with great apes, it becomes virtually certain that God chose to create humankind through the God as parent evolutionary pathway rather than the God as engineer creation from scratch scenario. In part three, we'll address the question of what all of this has to say about the nature of the God as parent activity. What is God doing and not doing if God has worked in a manner that is more like that of a parent as opposed to that of an engineer? Three. Three.